Audi. 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 Yeah, I love it. All right. Uh, in 2002, so I'm, I'm taking you back quite a few years. In 2002, I was in college and I was taking a class on intercultural communication. Uh, and my professor, Dr. Frank, uh, he, he was a mean old man that no one liked, but for some reason I, I kind of liked him. Um, so one day he said, uh, who wants to have some fun? And everybody raised their hands, because I mean, like, yeah, it's Dr. Frank's class, of course we want to have fun. Uh, and he said, okay, uh, who wants to grow spiritually? And again, we all raised our hands, like, yeah. And then he said, who is racist? And so I raised my hand. <laughs> uh, I said, I don't think I'm racist, but I really don't understand why Mexicans are stealing all of our jobs and why they don't learn English when they come to our country. And he said, Dave, I don't think you're racist either. I know you're racist. <laughs> and so he spent the, the rest of the semester trying to make me overcome my racism, help me come over, overcome my racism. He said, if you want to have fun, if you want to grow spiritually, and if you want to become less racist, you need to study abroad. You need to study abroad in Mexico, Dave. And I was like, <laughs> and no. Did you not hear the part where I don't like Mexicans? Uh, no. Uh, and so I said, uh, you know, I'm a first generation college student. There's no way I can afford to study abroad. He's like, I'll help you find grants. I'll help you find scholarships. You can do it. And I was like, I don't think so. And so later on in the semester, he's teaching and he does a lesson on, on Frida Kahlo, and he, that's the famous Mexican painter. Uh, and he goes, if you go on a study abroad to Mexico, anyone, Dave, uh, you can go see Frida Kahlo's house. And I love Frida Kahlo, so I was like, okay, you know. And then on days wherever there was any Spanish, so like the day after Halloween, uh, he's like, today is Dia de los Muertos. Dave, do you know what that means? That's pretty simple Spanish, <laughs> uh, Day of the Dead. He's like, oh my gosh, you should move to Mexico. You're so good at Spanish. <laughs> One day I came into class and I had partied a little too hard the night before, so I was exhausted. And he said, you know, Dave, that in Mexico they have something called the siesta, right? And right now would be siesta time. And so lo and behold, I found myself in Mexico studying abroad. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Dr. Frank, for helping me study abroad in Mexico, and it changed my life. It, it, it did make me a totally less racist. Uh, I fell in love with Mexican culture, with Mexican people, to the point where sometimes I say, soy mexicano, uh, I am Mexican, I am not, right? Um, I did do the 23andMe DNA test, and it said I was 4% Mexican, and that's the 4% that I own, so, <laughs> soy mexicano. Right? Uh, so I studied abroad in Mexico, and I loved it so much that I decided to study abroad in Mexico again. And then after Mexico, I studied abroad in China. And then from China, I studied abroad in Louisiana. Um, <laughs> I went to LSU for my PhD, and I will tell you, I lived in Mexico and I lived in China. The most culture shock I've ever experienced in my life was moving to Louisiana. Uh, some of you are like, I know. Right, uh, And then from Louisiana, I studied abroad in Costa Rica. And two weeks ago yesterday, I just got back from teaching abroad in Italy. So I've been in Europe all, 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 yeah, all semester. It was wonderful. Right? I loved it. So uh, howdy, I'm Dave Tarvin, and I teach at Texas A&M University in the communication department. Last year, I taught about, or last year here at AATH, I spoke about public speaking, but this year I'm going to talk about this newest course I just developed called The Rhetoric of Humor. This is what I was teaching in Italy. But first, you're probably like, the rhetoric of humor. What is the rhetoric of of humor. So I'm going to define both of these terms, rhetoric and then humor, and then define the rhetoric of humor. And uh, rhetoric we get from Aristotle, or if you like Chipotle, Aristotle. Um, <laughs> so Aristotle told us that rhetoric is the power of discovering the available means to persuasion in any given situation. And more importantly, Aristotle gave us the rhetorical triangle, the ethos, pathos, and logos. And uh, I'm, I'm hoping that some of you are familiar with ethos, logos, and pathos, but if not, I'll, I'll tell you about it. Logo, or ethos, I'm sorry, is your moral character, your ethical obligation to be a good person, right? Ethical ethos, that will help you remember it. Uh, logos is logic of appearances, logos, logic. 
And then pathos is suffering. Um, today we kind of think of it more as an appeal to emotions, but Aristotle thought it was appeal to suffering. And so uh, when I teach about Aristotle and uh, his rhetorical triangle, I tend to go to something uh, like Hurricane Katrina, which is the exact opposite of humor, right? Hurricane Katrina is extremely tragic. But the way we responded to Hurricane Katrina isn't so tragic. It's kind of humorous. Uh, so in fact, uh, I wasn't in Louisiana at the time of Hurricane Katrina, but being there a few years later, that's what everybody talked about, Hurricane Katrina. And they talked about how the newscasters went on to uh, the forecast, you know, and they went on to all the radio stations, all the television stations, and said, this storm is going to be really bad. We need you all to leave. Uh, and so people were like, no. Right. Uh, logic doesn't tend to win the day, right? And so then the mayor of New Orleans, Ray Naglin, he said, actually, it is required that you leave. I'm uh, having an evacuation of the entire city, the first time in the city's history. Um, and people didn't pay attention. And then finally, police officers knocked on door to door, and they gave people that stayed a permanent marker, and they said, we need you to write your social security number on your arm. Um, because when we find your body, we need to be able to identify you. Not if, but when, right? I think it's really uh, quite incongruous that people did not pay attention to the logic of the forecasters. I think it's absurd that we think governor, gover or mayors or anybody in government should be trusted. Um, <laughs> And I think it's kind of comedic that it required that suffering, that pathos, to finally motivate people to flee the city of New Orleans. I lived in Baton Rouge, and they left, and they came to Baton Rouge, and they stayed. Um, so what is humor? Well, it's exactly those things that I just said happened with Hurricane Katrina, right? A comic, absurd, or incongruous quality that causes amusement. And Hurricane Katrina does not amuse me, but again, the way we tried to motivate people to leave the city does. So we have ethos, logos, and pathos, but I think Aristotle forgot something. I think he forgot humos, <laughs> right? And that's a word that I just made up. So if you're like looking in the dictionary, what the hell's humos? It'll be like, mm -hmm, right? Um, humos, right? What is humos? Well, I'm going to define it as the use of humor as an available means to persuasion, because I think humor can persuade. Right? Uh, Dr. Frank persuaded me to move to Mexico to get over my own racism through his use of humorous jokes throughout class, through his use of the incongruity of always making every subject matter relate to Mexico in some way. And that's what I'm calling the rhetoric of humor, the use of humos to, to motivate individuals into action. Um, Kenneth Burke, who is the most famous communication scholar out there, I know we have some communication folks in, in the department, or in the, in the conference, so you probably know Kenneth Burke, he calls it the comic corrective. Um, he says, the primary attitude of comedy is not rejection, but instead of acceptance, that we need to accept one another. Suffering, tragedy, is the frame of rejection. Um, specifically, that we should see people as, uh, not as vicious, but simply as mistaken. Right? So that's how he defines comedy. It's a corrective. It corrects tragedy because we realize that the people that mess up aren't messing up because they're evil people. They're messing up because they made a mistake, and we've all played the fool before. Going on with Kenneth Burke, he calls comic laughter, uh, he defines comic laughter as the ability to get a collective to laugh together, um, and he says it gives us the power to start over. So at the end of my presentation, if it's not good, I'm going to ask us to all collectively laugh, and then I'm going to try it again. Uh, Mikhail, or we know that, that uh, starting over is something we celebrate, right? When do we laugh the most? We laugh at New Year's when we're starting over a new year. We laugh at graduation parties when we're starting over and we have to have a new job. We laugh at birthday parties when we start over because we have a new year. Um, we laugh at uh, Halloween at the start of Christmas. And we also laugh <laughs> at Mardi Gras, right? Uh, Mardi Gras, a Catholic holiday that's been celebrated for centuries, extremely important. Um, in Europe, it's called Carnival. And so uh, this is some pictures from my time just recently at Carnival in Italy. Uh, here we have a, 
whale that's made out of complete plastic to make fun of uh, our current climate situation. Uh, we have my students celebrating with comic laughter. They're starting over after having a terrible time with me in their as their professor. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, here we have uh, our favorite politician, Donald Trump, because he's a dream come true. If you see, he's in. I think it's a nightmare, but uh, no, it's a, it, it was a dream, right? Uh, the port and the importance of carnival is it allows us to start over by making fun of the people in power. Because if we say that a king or queen farts and shits. They're now people, right? Just because we all do that too. And so if we make fun of our politicians, it allows us to overcome the tragedy of what's happening. Here's one of my favorite photos with some of my students, uh, another making fun of, of our president. My favorite is the sword. I don't know if you can see on the, on the right with the sword, there's tweets. The birds are making up his swords. I, I just, everything about this costume was amazing, and it was huge, as you can see. Um, by the picture. So that's Carnival and uh, Mikhail Bakhtin, who's a very famous Russian philosopher. Uh, he thinks that Carnival is very important. He also sees the importance of starting over. He says that with comic laughter, we uh, are liberated. We're not only liberated from our external censorship, from the people outside of us telling us we're not allowed to laugh, but we're also liberated from ourselves, from within inside. Like, am I scared of this? Am I terrified of this? Am I allowed to laugh at that? Well, once we laugh, we no longer have that fear. Uh, it liberates us from the fear of the sacred, of the fear of the prohibitions, and the fear of the past, and the fear of power. Now, when I talk about Mikhail Bakhtin, I oftentimes, because we're in Europe anyway, I'm going to also talk about a group called Atpour. Have any of you heard of Atpour? I thought maybe some of you would. OK, so Atpour is a group that was started in October of 98 uh, in Serbia. We're in Serbia right now. And it was created by a network of students and young folks that uh, created visibility with the clenched fist. Now, this clenched fist has since become a symbol for social movements. If you've seen The Office, when Dwight becomes the acting manager, Jim posts this image everywhere in The Office, resists Dwight as the acting manager, right? Um, it was this group, Odpor, used humor to show absurdity in the Serbian dictatorship at the time. They used humor to make the group look cool, and they used humor to do what Mikhail Bakhtin said, which is to reduce fear um, of this oppressive regime. Right? So uh, Mira Makovic, who was the dictator's wife at the time, famously stated in, uh, October, in 2000, the communists came to power with blood, so we will not leave power without blood. So Atpour responded by creating the largest blood drive in Serbian history. Right? They used humor in a way that made it impossible for Mira and her husband to respond, because no matter how they responded, they looked ridiculous. And now that people are starting to laugh at this scary regime, this scary regime is just a regime. It's no longer scary. Uh, one of my favorite examples that Atpour did was they had a commercial that was on television. And they had a lady, and it had a shirt, and it had uh, the dictator's face on it. And they put it into the washing machine. They put some Tide in it. And then they take the shirt out of the washing machine, and it's a clean white shirt. And they're like, look, Tide gets the shit out of your clothing. <laughs> Uh, and so once we started laughing, uh, her, her speech was in uh, 2000. By October of 2000, the Serbian dictatorship fell. Um, and now there's democracy. And Otpor is a democratic party now in Serbia. All right, so humor, humos, right, was used. Because humos allowed Otpor to build character, to build more uh, relatability to its people uh, in Serbia. And so people wanted to join the group. Lots of folks, lots of people, uh, huge, huge, right? They used the incongruity of the logic of the dictators and made fun of it, right? You came to power with blood? Well, we'll give you blood. We'll give you good blood, right? We'll donate blood. Um, and then they used pathos, uh, humos, use, we can use humos to overcome pathos, to overcome suffering. And like I said, it didn't take but a few months for this dictatorship to fall um, after Atpour really got, motive, got really started um, with their campaign. Right? Now, humor sounds amazing, but there are some dangers. Right? My brother famously, this brother, right? he famously calls humor the salt to a meal. 
right? You just want to sprinkle it on your meal. You don't want an entire plate of salt, because if you did, that would make you a horse. And he says, you don't want to be a horse, right? That would be bad. He says, nay, right? Um, <laughs> nay to being a horse. There are three ways that humor can be inappropriate. So these are three dangers that we have with humor. First, if the subject matter is bad, right? That is a danger. Second, if the target is incorrect, that can be a danger. Um, and third is what this conference is about. It's timing. Timing can be inappropriate, right? Uh, and, and so we have to be aware of our subject, our target, and our time at all times, right? <laughs> Um, that took you way too long. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, when I was teaching the rhetoric of humor over in Italy, my students' favorite book was by Mary Kay Morrison. Uh, they loved this book, so good job. Okay. And one of the lines is, even if the intent is not to hurt, if the impact is hurtful, it's not appropriate. Right? Uh, and I think that's a really good line to live by when using humor. She says, also in her book, she talks a little bit about humorphobia. Sorry, Mary Kay, that's not a very good drawing. Um, where she says humorphobia is people are afraid to use humor because they're afraid of, of, of a loss of work time, or they're afraid they're going to look silly, or they're afraid that uh, they'll be made fun of, or they're afraid that they're inadequate, or they're afraid that they'll, they'll lose some kind of control. And, that is all really good reasons not to use humor, but, but I have a toolkit that helps you overcome all of that, and it's called the humor map. The humor map. So today I'm going to be talking a lot about the humor map, and the humor map is simply your medium, audience, and purpose, right? Your medium, if you know your medium, that's your how. How are you going to use humor, right? Uh, so you can use it face to face, you can do it via tweets, uh, or you can do it even via email. And no matter which medium you use is going to impact or change the way that you use humor. What you can say face to face might not work in a tweet, which might not work via email, right? Some of the things that we've said at this conference were like, that's hilarious, and then like, how do I, write, how do I tweet this? And it, it just doesn't work, right? So we need to know how we're going to use the humor, and that will impact the kind of humor we use. I get a ton of emails um, every day, and in order to make myself a little bit more productive and to navigate these emails, uh, I came up with a little game for myself where I make my name, Dave Tarvin, a hyperlink to a Disney song. I love Disney, right? So uh, say a student emails me, and they're like, hey, I'm really interested in the class you're teaching in the fall. Can you, can you tell me a little bit more about your class? Uh, then I'll tell them all about the class, and then my name is a hyperlink to a whole new world, right? Because I can show them a whole new world through my class. And again, this is through email. If, I, if they came to me person, person right, face to face, and they're like, hey, can you tell me about your class? And I was like, shining, shimmering, splendid. They'd be like, what the hell, right? Uh, so it works in email. If a student uh, thanks me, right, they're like, thank you for writing me that letter of recommendation. My name is a hyperlink to Moana's, you're welcome. <laughs> and then if a student sends me an email complaining about a grade, obviously I go with Ursula's poor, unfortunate soul. Um, so I try to incorporate humor to get through the emails, and emails is one medium of how we can communicate. The next step in the humor map is your audience, and your audience is your who, who you want to talk to. I was just in Europe, like I was saying, and in, I have a condition called gouty arthritis, which means I cannot have any kind of seafood. So I go to a, a presentation, I give this presentation, and at the end they're like, let's take you to dinner. I'm like, that's wonderful. They're like, do you have any allergies? And I said, yes, seafood. I can't have any kind of seafood. Oh, perfect. We know the, the great spot. So they take me to this restaurant. We walk in. I get gout right away just because of the smell of fish. And I'm like, what the hell? And I look at the menu, and it's all fish. And I'm like, they hated me. <laughs> Maybe we should all start laughing so we can start over, because I just told them that I can't have seafood. But I soon discovered that in British English, or European English, seafood is only shellfish. And fish is a completely separate category. So you have to know your audience. They thought, yes, he can't have shellfish, but surely he can have fish, right? Um, we're in uh, Chicago, and so if I show you this image, how many of you say this is pop? How many of you say it's soda? 
Oh, soda wins today. Uh, we're in Chicago, so we should call it pop. If you come down to Texas, you'll call it Coke. Right? If you go to a restaurant and you ask for a Coke, they're going to say, what flavor? And the correct answer is Dr. Pepper. We live by Dr. Pepper in, in Texas, right? Um, we're in Chicago, so if we say bean, we might think of refried beans, but actually we're in Chicago, we need to know our audience and know that they're referring to the bean, right? Yeah, the silver bean. And uh, we're in Chicago, so if somebody says something about LSD, we're not talking about that fun drug we did in college, right? We're talking about the Lakeshore Drive. Right? So know your audience, uh, understand them a little bit before you start to employ humor, because otherwise it can, it can, you can be ending up in a fish restaurant when you're not allowed to have seafood. Right? The purpose is the why. Why are you trying to use humor? Why would you want to incorporate humor into your everyday lives? Why do I use humor in the classroom? Well, I use humor in the classroom because it helps my students pay attention, it helps us to understand the material, and it uh, helps us to remember the information. So a lot of times on their exams, I'll see uh, notes or sketches of, of things I've said in class, uh, and they write it right next to the answer on the test, right, uh, to help them remember. So it helps us pay attention. Uh, I had a, a, a teacher come in and observe my class. I teach large lecture classes, so typically around 300 students. And a, another teacher came in, and afterwards she came up to me and she said, Dave, you had 300 students. And I was like, yeah, it's a class. It has about 320, I don't know, something students. And she goes, but no, they all showed up. And I was like, is that? not how they're supposed to act. <laughs> and she's like, I don't get that kind of attendance. I have like 50-50, you know? Like, I'm lucky if 100 students come to class. How did you get them to come to class? And not only that, they were all engaged. They were all paying attention to your lecture. They weren't on Reddit or Facebook. What I don't understand. And so I was like, I don't, I don't know. So I asked my TA, my teaching assistant, I said, Lindsay, why is everybody here and why are they paying attention? And she goes, well, first of all, you always tell jokes. And so we have to make sure we're paying attention because it, there's nothing worse than you're like dazed off and all of a sudden the entire class of 300 students is laughing and you're like, what are they laughing at? And second of all, you draw all of us and so we have to make sure that we're not gonna be in your presentation. For instance, I think that's me because you always draw me with a scarf and I was like, what? And I was, oh, there, that is you, <laughs> right? Uh, so my teaching assistant is the one closest to me over here with the scarf, Lindsay, right? Um, and so it, it helps us pay attention. And like I said, I draw all of my students even when I have thousands um, just because it, it keeps them engaged and then I can use them in the lecture, right? I want you all to now use the paper in front of you and a pen to do a little activity. And we are at a humor conference, so you all have the yes and mindset already. I don't have to beg you to do this. You'll just, yes and, right? What I'd like for you to do is to draw a V, or write a V, just in the middle of your page, a V. And then on top of that V, put like C's, like a, a backward C and a forward C at the top of the V, kind of like what I have here. Once you have your little V with the C's, I want you to connect the top of the two C's so that we have a longhorn. I am from Texas, after all. Right. So we have our longhorn, right? Does everybody, you've, you've done something so far? You got a longhorn? Similar? Okay, good. Let's add some, like, tears on the left side, of, or on the right side of him, right? He's, he's a sad longhorn. I teach at Texas A&M University, and the longhorns are our rival, so... Uh, right, so he's sad because A&M beats uh, the Longhorns every year, right? Now, from our Longhorns' horns, we're going to just draw two lines straight up, right? Just two lines straight up, boop, boop. Okay, and then we're going to draw a J, a backwards J, or an L, or a hook uh, on top of those two lines. Have you all ever been sp splunking? Cave, and you know how they tell you where a cave is located by putting those rocks on top of each other, stacking those rocks up, and you know there's a cave right there, right? We're gonna do that also, but the opposite way. So we'll draw one rock there, and then draw four more rocks above it that get progressively bigger, just a little bit bigger. Now, from that top rock, I want you to just draw like a rectangle. From that rectangle, we're gonna draw one more rock, 
and hopefully you've kind of discovered what this is. It's a thumb. Now around this whole image, I want us to draw a square, like a, a big rectangle around the whole thing. And then immediately next to what has become our pen, right, that's that long rectangle square, that's a pen, I want you to draw a smiley face. And then I want you to just write underneath the sleeve, humor that works. Because what you've just drawn is my brother's new book. <laughs> and hopefully that will help you pay attention to buy his book after this, after this presentation. <laughs> and I get commission, yeah, right? So I better get commission after all this. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, no, it helps us pay attention, and the way that I do that is through drawing. And some of you are like, but I'm not a drawler. Well, you just drew something right now. You drew Drew's book, right? I'm sure he would love to see pictures of your drawing of his book, right? Um, I started with stick figures when I first started doing graphic facilitation, uh, just a circle with lines, and then over the semesters, I just started to embellish those drawings, and, and I got a little bit better. I'm nowhere near Kyle's level, but I am at least, I can do a, a silly cartoon every once in a while, right? Next, so it helps us pay attention, but next, humor also helps us to understand, right? Do you all know what a euphomium is? What's a euphomium? Like a tuba, right? Like a small tuba. This is the instrument I actually played in high school. I called it a baritone, but it's also known as a euphony, right? Like a small tuba. I could have said it's a series of brass alloys that when you blow into and you push buttons down, it makes noise, and no one would understand that. But by associating it to a small tuba, thank you, right, uh, we now understand what a euphonium is, right? So associations really, really help us to understand. For instance, say I want to teach something new. I have to teach this new, uh, really difficult article. Like I have an article, a scholarly article that just came out. I need to teach it. So I picked a scholarly article. Increase chronic stress predicts greater emotional negativity bias and poor social skills, but not cognitive functioning in healthy adults. Someone needs to help them with their titles. That's a little long, right? Um, and so I think we can actually tell them that because this was written by our very own Heidi Hanna. Ooh. Right? So I don't know if any of you took the time to read her newest article, but it's, uh, you know, I'm not a nurse, neurologist, or what is she, a neuroscientist? Neuroscientist, so it might go over your head, right? We need to use humor to help us understand this material. And so the way that I do associations, if you remember from my speech last year, is a 10 by 10 matrix. I put 10 things down in one category, the 10 things from uh, her article that I find most important, the key words. So we have chronic stress, cognitive functioning, emotional functioning, right? And then I just come up with 10 items that I actually really, really like that aren't related to the article itself. However, her article had a lot of exclusions. And so before I even get to my 10 by 10 matrix, right, they wanted participants for their study, but you had to be the right kind of participant, so I had to find the right Disney character for this exercise, right? So I listed some of my favorite Disney characters here and looked at her article, and one of the first things the article mentions that their participants have to speak English as a first language. So that means Jasmine can't be my go-to, Miguel can't be, Mulan can't be, Pocahontas, no, and Princess Jasmine's father, no. They're excluded, so I'm, I'm down, right? Another exclusion from her survey, so participants in her survey, they also could not have been unconscious for more than 10 minutes in their lifetime, so Sleeping Beauty, you're gone, right? Uh, they also had no history of alcohol or heavy marijuana consumption, so Dumbo, I, that scene still scares me, uh, Gaston, heavy drinker, uh, Goofy, you had to be on something, right? Um, and Jack Sparrow, alcoholic, so they're all out too, right? Another exclusive criteria was that you couldn't have history of ADHD, so poof, I'm gone, right? No schizophrenia, no bipolar disorder, so that means that Dory is gone, Hulk is gone, uh, and Tigger, who has ADHD, he's gone as well, right? <laughs> Another exclusive uh, criteria is that they couldn't have anything that implemented or uh, impeded their vision, their hearing, or their hand movements, so Captain Hook, you're out. 
Uh, they couldn't have a history of mental illness, so Ariel, you're out. I mean, she's a hoarder, right? You've seen her grotto. She just hoards everything, right? Look at this stuff. Isn't it neat? No, you're a hoarder. Get help, right? Um, so no Ariel, right? Um, they couldn't have a blood-borne illness, right? So then uh, Jack Skellington, he doesn't have blood. And then Spider-Man, he was bitten by a spider, so they're out too. And the last criteria was that they had to be an adult uh, at least 18 years old, so Nemo and Simba are out, which left us with Cinderella. Okay, so we have Cinderella. Now we can go back to our 10 by 10 matrix and put in 10 things about Cinderella's story that we are interested in. Right? From this matrix now, we try to make logical or even sometimes illogic connections. Connections between the material so that when I'm teaching cognitive stress, I could compare it to having to clean, right, to being a maid. When I'm teaching about being a healthy doll, I can talk about the guest at the ball. So when I'm talking about Heidi's uh, article and I get to the conclusions, I can say that, well, they surveyed 1,883 1, uh, participants. That's like going to the ball with that many guests, right? Um, there were 861 ladies and 1,000 gentlemen. So ladies, this is the ball for you, right? You're definitely <laughs> going to find your Prince Charming, right? Um, and they use the depression, anxiety, stress scale to do that. And that's kind of like her shoes, right? Because Prince Charming went around causing a lot of stress to all the ladies in town because their shoes wouldn't fit right um, and, and causing them uh, depression afterwards that they're not going to be the, the queen, right? Uh, and so from this study, from Heidi's study, we found that females are more stressed than men. And obviously, they have more responsibilities, right? Uh, women have evil stepsisters that make them clean all the time. Right? The study also found that more stress equaled more negativity bias. Negativity bias is having that disposition to everything. Nothing's ever going to work out. And it also uh, related to decreased social skills. So you're no longer uh, as, as social as you were because you're so stressed out. And that makes a lot of sense with Cinderella. She was so stressed out cleaning that house all the time. Her social skills were nothing. All she talked to was animals, right? Um, so <laughs> obviously her high stress caused some um, negativity bias. She wouldn't go to the ball and it also caused uh, a lacking of social skills. But the major finding of Heidi's study was that chronic stress does not equal or does not mean that you have less cognitive functioning. And so even though Cinderella has those evil stepsisters, she's still intelligent, right? Even though she's chronically stressed out, it doesn't impede her cognition. And that's one way that we can learn material, understand material, is through associations like Disney characters. Finally, a third tip I have for using humor or why we use humor is it helps us to remember. We are all storytellers, right? Storytelling, since the time we were born, we have heard stories, right? So stories are really important, and they help us remember material because we'll be like, that one time, right? This material is like that one time that this happened or this one time that that happened, right? Um, experience is obviously the best teacher, but storytelling, my brother told me this just last night, and I loved it. He's like, storytelling is experience without suffering. And I was like, ooh, I bet you stole that, because that's too good to be a Drew Tarvin original, right? <laughs> um, right? Um, storytelling is experience without suffering. So last night, we heard this wonderful story uh, about Chip and his daughter in New Orleans. And his, I know your daughter had just graduated high school, but I thought it was more fun to draw her as a little kid. Um, and she said, I could be a stripper. Uh, <laughs> And so we learn from his story, right? Don't take your daughter to New Orleans. <laughs> Experience it without the suffering, right? Uh, for storytelling, I tell my students to use CAR, right? Which is contents, action, and results. So lay out your story in this format. Tell us the context of the situation, what events happened, and then what were the results of those events. So, for instance, when I told you about Dr. Frank, right, the context of the situation was he wanted to improve his students. He wanted his students to uh, have fun. He wanted his students to grow, and he wanted his students to be less racist. The way he did that was by constantly speaking Spanish in my class or asking me to translate Spanish, right? And the results of that story were that I studied abroad in Mexico. Context, action, 
and results. It helps us to remember. Storytelling is an activity that helps us to remember. Improv activities are an activity that help us to remember. And so when we're looking at humor, humor helps us remember. Oh, wrong button, wrong way. I was like, that's not supposed to happen, right? All right, so we started with Aristotle's rhetorical triangle, ethos, logos, and pathos. And I, uh, I think that drawings are a part of humos, right? They're a part of logic. My drawings are incongruous. My students aren't expecting drawings when they come in. Well, now they are. But before they come into my class, they're not expecting their teacher to draw pictures of them. That, that's absurd, right? Um, humos is also, it plays to our ethos, right? It builds character. It makes us more relatable. Right? Uh, because now people are engaged. They want to pay attention. And it plays to our uh, pathos as well. Humos, through storytelling, we can overcome suffering because we can explain or we can tell stories to help people learn so that they themselves don't have to suffer. Like I said, I made up this word, but I'm calling it humos. Right? Humos goes into Aristotle's rhetorical triangle. We can use humor like they used in Atpur uh, to get dictatorships to fall. Uh, I should have done a little bit more research, but I'm sure you saw in the news recently, is it hung Hungary? Was it Hungary, right, where this, the comedian just got elected? Yeah, 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 Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia? It was Yugos no, no, no. That's not even a place anymore. Ukraine. Oh, it was Ukraine. OK, right? Uh, uh, so we see Humos has some really strong rhetorical powers. I started today by telling you about Dr. Frank. He taught intercultural communication uh, when I was an undergrad. And he started by asking just a simple question. Uh, I love Dr. Frank. I went to Mexico because of him. I studied abroad in China with him. And so one day I, I said, Dr. he said, Dave, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, honestly, Dr. Frank, I want to be you. I want to teach intercultural communication. I want to take students abroad. I want to inspire them the way you inspired me. And like I said, uh, I'm Dave Tarvin. I teach intercultural communication. I take students abroad now. I am Dr. Frank. So I will leave you with Dr. Frank's question. Who wants to have some fun? Thank you very much.